Yeah, the session. Hello, everyone. How are you? Everyone excited about Container D? Who knows what Container D is? That's good. <laughs> That's better than a few years ago that nobody even knew what that. Um, I don't know if we should start or is booked for 12. It's a little bit earlier. I don't know if someone in the back can tell people that they're going to start, maybe. Oh. <laughs> but before, before we start, because we are a little bit earlier, we want to ask something. We want to ask what that session is about. If you are on the right session, I don't want you to be you know, in a wrong session. That session is about um, how Kubernetes, how Docker, how containers, are running on your machine today, and you don't even probably know how that works. And you're going to understand how, how the containers and how Kubernetes runs the pods and the containers on your cluster. And also, how you, you when you have in your um, Docker desktop installed, then you just do a Docker run, how that works you know, under the hood. I think that's why most of people never had a look on this, unless you're using containers. Who's using containers for more than five years? Who saw the beginning of the Docker from Container D, then probably remember how those things become. But the thing is, it's still growing, and still growing very fast. Um, and you're going to see maybe a percentage of what I know I'm not a, a Container D maintainer, but I have been following the team. I was uh, at KubeCon US last year, uh, following the team as well, and I've done probably two or three sessions about Container D before at DockerCon last year. If you wanna watch, I did that session explaining why Docker is using now Container D on Docker Desktop more than before, and you're going to see the reason that's happening. And even if Container D was a, a, a project created by Docker and donated to CNCF many years ago, I think it was 2017, around 2017. But after that donation, the project you know, grew legs and um, is maintained pretty much by the whole com community, all the big uh, players and, uh, and the communities are maintaining the project. And that's where we're going to, to deep dive on this project. If you want to follow me, I'm George Artero. I'm a cloud developer advocate on the cloud native space for Microsoft. And anything on Azure Kubernetes service, anything on the Microsoft open source projects on CNCF, there's quite a few. We're going to have Will sitting here at the front to be three o'clock, 3.20, will be your session on Project Radius. That's another since a uh, sensor project that was donated by Microsoft around KubeCon US last year is a sandbox project now. But there are many others like Helm, Depa, uh, and so on that we have donated, Synap bundles, a few projects that probably, if you look on the, on the CNCF, was donated by Microsoft. And that's what I do. I'm also a Docker captain, and I like to talk things around Docker for a long time. I saw someone with a container camp shirt. I don't think he's sitting here, but it was a container camp conference what, back in 2017, 18. That's where those things started for eyes in Australia. Became real 2016, 17, 18, when you know, Brendan Burns, the guy that created Kubernetes that works for Microsoft now was here back 2017. And since then, we had all those conferences and now KubeCons and, and KCDs. But everything started with this Docker run for me. I mean, the first thing I have to understand about uh, running like a container, how the container runs, is just try yourself. Nginx, probably the easy way, because you can open the browser, just a reverse pro proxy. If you do a Docker run, uh, exposing those ports, the dash D means detached, and the port number exposing uh, port 80 on the container and port 8078 on the host. And 
running like a Docker run like this was the first presentation that was done in 2013 by, by Solomon Hikes when he presented Docker in five minutes. He had five minutes in a conference, like if anyone's doing like a short talk here today, he had five minutes to show this. And it's just a command. But behind the scene, that's creating like a network, it's creating IP number, could be connecting like a volume, and everything's running using isolation on Linux. But I'm using here, I'm a, I have a Windows laptop and I have Windows subsystem for Linux. And pretty much I work on Linux most of my day. Um, it's easier than create a virtual machine. You know, I just use the WSL. And you're going to show, I'm going to show that I have like, I have Ubuntu running, I have Debian running, I have a few you know, distros running in parallel. And this Docker run, I run not on my Docker desktop. <laughs> I did install Docker and ContainerD to be able to run this command without my Docker desktop, and I'm going to show how I did it. And I recommend you to use Docker desktop, probably be easier for you to. But if you are a developer and you wanna learn, you wanna integrate with ContainerD, you probably wanna do from scratch and learn how that works. And if you wanna be a contributor on the project as well. But on this run here, you can see the port numbers and all the connections, and now you can open this on the browser. And it was done with a single command. And that's the magic here. And also how those image, say Docker image, that's big part of our talk today is explaining how those container image uh, they are downloaded from the hash tree and how they, they can be lazy loading from the hash tree. And you're going to see that, but all starts here, okay? And that's the beginning, Docker, um, Docker engine, and now it's called Mobi. Who knows what Mobi project is? If you go on GitHub, you can see Mobi, and this is Mobi project. It's pretty much what Docker donated, you know, create like a community edition Docker engine at the time, and they have the enterprise edition where they sell for customers with license and support. And, and that enterprise edition is my rent is now, it's not even Docker anymore. And Docker now is focused on the, the, the developer side, you know, people doing developing local development. But that's how Docker works. There's this Docker D, Docker daemon. When I did the Docker run there, that command line, the Docker CLI, command line interface, talks with the Docker D. Docker D is going to call with this container D. That's my talk today. That's a, I call this a high level, or like a library, a framework. It's a bunch of components that can be extendable with plugins, and I'm going to see how that architecture works in details. Um, but Docker just called that container D and said, can you run that for me? I need to run this. And then container D is going to figure out networking. Um, the way that Docker does a little bit different because Docker manages network differently. You're going to see how that works. But end of the day, on the right, you can see that Docker is doing networking. You can even do orchestration with Docker, Docker called Docker Swarm. Um, but it's all focused now, Docker is focused on the development side, not in production anymore. And container D's, everything that you run today that's container in production is mostly container D, okay? Some people are still running like Mobi in production. Is something that we would recommend today? Probably not. If you run it just like a Docker, install Docker in a Linux server and you run your container like a single instance, what's the point of containers if you're going to run in a single instance? There's no much point. That's why I need the orchestrator. And Kubernetes is fully integrated with this container D piece there. Who remembers like three years ago saying that Docker was going to be removed from, from Kubernetes. Docker was going to be removed from Kubernetes and was a concern, a nightmare everywhere. Um, probably is not bad. Was just because ContainerD was calling, you know, was you could make Kubernetes to use the runtime from Docker and that was removed, but nothing changed to be honest. If you're not using anything specifically from Docker at the time, should be fine, and we are fine now. There is no Docker anymore on Kubernetes, pretty much container D. 
I hope not. I hope nobody's using Tokashim legacy um, still. But and that run C, that's what the runtime is. Many people say that container D is a runtime, but container D is a is a library, okay, and um, a API, many things, but it's not the runtime itself. The runtime is run C, and you can see there are others. That's the default for Linux. And they use that namespace isolation, you know, C groups, all these Linux containers. Uh, features on Linux, on the Linux, Linux kernel to isolate your application, your workload, and create your container. Everything's on top of the Linux kernel, and and that's how it works. And why we need that? We now why we need you know container D, and one of the reasons Docker started using that was lazy loading, because Docker never implemented lazy loading, um, is, is snapshot as how they call, and to to not to download, remember this, look this, the first slide, look the size of the Nginx there, how big it is, 279 megabytes, okay? And this thing, lays loading, is going to say, oh, I don't have to download the whole 279 at once, because that's the time, this graph shows how long it takes to use, on the left, the longer, the longer one is without lays loading snapshotters, that only downloads the files that they need to run the containers on demand, and it's a huge difference. So, because we need performance, we want to have these on your local development as well. Now you can do that with Docker Desktop, and also another reason is the WebAssembly. So, anyone using WebAssembly was me, wasn't time, nobody using WebAssembly yet? Next year, we're probably going to be using WebAssembly. <laughs> or maybe in two years. But th that's the next big thing. Even on the keynote, you know, we talk about that. And then, now you can run, I'm going to show WebAssembly running here on my laptop. And you can also build mode platform. If you're using WebAssembly, probably you don't care about mode platform anymore, because you can run anywhere. But if you want to build, you know, for ARM, um, for um, X64, and you wanna, you wanna have this Docker build that wasn't available on Docker desktop anymore, and now Docker is supporting this. Why? Because ContainerD created all those features. Docker donated ContainerD to CNCF and kind of um, not forgot, but never integrated Docker desktop with the latest features, and now that's done. Now it's fully, if you install Docker desktop today, it's like ContainerD there, if you install Rancher Desktop, anyone, it's pretty much only container D. I start a little bit earlier. If anyone arriving now, that's fine. I, I can give you, you know, some spoilers, but you, you got on the right time. Normally, who, who come later because, you know, have some experience here. I can see Tiago, I can see <laughs> They all have experience on, 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 on containers already. But let's get started with the architecture. Um, the main, um, components, let's say, of um, ContainerD. Um, the first thing they're using is gRPC. Let's say it's a gRPC API that you're going to call. And you're going to go in more details on the next slide, on the few slides after that. But let's get you know the main components there. What I need to run a container, I did like um, I need a Docker image. That's the first thing I need. And then you have the storage there with you know, the snapshots. Um, it's pretty much the file system, the root file system of your container is going to come from those snapshots, from those content there. And then you have the metadata. Metadata is just you know, the, the hash tree. Like when you create a container, I did Docker run there. A container was created and a metadata was created on this container table there. The same for, for the Docker image, for the image. And what ContainerD calls as a container is not a container, it's a task. A task is a container running, and container is just the definition of the container, it's just the metadata. So ContainerD is a task, is a container running, okay? And the way that they, you know, those servers that you're going to see here, they're pretty much the developer using microservers, and the task that creates the container is just called the runtime. Remember the ContainerD calling the, the run C? Here, container D calling run C, that's pretty much what happened here, tasks calling uh, runtimes. 
and then you have the operating system of each node. That's not Kubernetes yet, that's just container D. Imagine you get a Linux server installing container D and you have this. Um, you get to see how that works on Kubernetes. And then that's the whole ecosystem of uh, container D that pretty much everything that you guys are using on Kubernetes, on, on containers, are um, some way part of that. Then we can break these in clients. Then you have Kubernetes, Kubelet. That's the agent that runs on each node on Kubernetes cluster. And that's the one that's going to use that container runtime interface that was created by, by Kubernetes at the time uh, to make sure that it could talk with the runtime and ContainerD just implemented that container runtime interface, and now it's part of ContainerD itself. It used to be a plugin, now is fully integrated inside the code of ContainerD. Is probably one of the exceptions there. And um, and then I have the Docker. Like I said, the Docker is pretty much using the Go library. And the first question here is why Go? Because everything was developed, you know, Docker was developing Go, and we end up, everybody using Go everywhere. And the main reason is because the only library, client library available is in Go at the moment. There's something being worked on Rust. But some people, why, why everything for containers developing Go? That's the main reason. If you guys want to develop libraries in other language, please do it. Uh, but at the moment, everyone uses this Go library there. Uh, that's called ContainerD client in Go, and it's being used by BuildKit that builds the container when you do Docker build to build the Docker image. Um, uh, who is using Docker build? And who is using who is using Docker build here to build your image? Pretty much everyone using Docker build, but you can you know BuildKit is the open source that can build your image, and uh, that's this project that's using also. A container D to build the image um, as a repository, but it's a library to build. Then it's not just container D. Now you can see that those other components around that, container D is just this middle part here. Everything else is kind of extension. It's kind of developed by partner, integrating the, including those clients, including those run times that we saw run C, uh, and you're going to see that container shim is snapshot is all developed by, you know, it's not part of container D itself. Uh, they are plugins pretty much, all clients. And um, we're going in more details, but on the API side, that's why we talk with, uh, with um, container D, it's pretty much a gRPC API, and also that container runtime interface to Kubernetes to talk. It's kind of <laughs> two different interface because um, I think Kubernetes is the main pretty much uh, customer of container D, but there are other users as well. And all the metrics collection and um, also was created like another project called NetCTL. It's a command line like Docker CLI that pretty much imitates Docker CLI and you can do pretty much everything Docker CLI can do it. The Docker run, you can use NetCTL run. The same way that I did, just replace Docker with NetCTL and you can run your container. Okay, in, there are projects here for, to run that on Mac as well, to simulate Windows subsystem for Linux that I'm using here. By the way, people are simulating Windows subsystem for Linux on Mac, you know that? You can have a Windows subsystem, uh, like a, not Windows, but a Linux subsystem on Mac is one of those projects here, uh, you know on the right, on the top there. And then um, let's, let's break this a little bit more. And you can see that uh, WASI is at the bottom there, that WASI. That WASI there is WebAssembly. That's so called WebAssembly interface, you know, and uh, that's how you run WebAssembly. And who run WebAssembly is ContainerD. Means that ContainerD is not just running containers now, they're running WebAssembly as well. They're running more than containers. Means that ContainerD is more than just containers. The name now maybe you have to rename or something, but um, so it's a library that can run more than containers and also can run those other guys there who had about Kata containers or Firecracker, Gvisor. Those are now running containers inside the virtual machine. 
Hyper-V containers that Microsoft created back in 2016, every one after that followed the same you know, path to create that Hyper-V or virtualization around the containers. And yeah, Microsoft was the first one. I remember 2016 when they released Hyper-V containers and, and now we have these very lightweight uh, options there. We have one Azure Kubernetes service um, from Microsoft and we have Kata containers there. And, um, but we're going, going to see more details. And that's container D, fully integrated with these other components. And how that Docker run <laughs> works here. When you do a Docker run, um, the client, remember the client there, the Docker is a client here. Docker is a client on the top. Doc container engine, Docker, they use the Go library. The client there, and they just talk with the snap uh, snapshot service. They just say, I want to run that container, and then they have to prepare the snapshot that's pretty much the root file system of your container. And then when you get this ready, you just create the container. Remember, container, for container this is just the metadata. It's not the running container yet. See, I want to create that container with that definition. And then you create the task that's the running container, the instance of the container, the running container. And that's the most important part now. The task servers that create the instance of the container, they don't run the container directly. They use these, these shims. The shims are the babysitters of your container. That's how the team calls the container these. They're going to babysit your container, and they're a separate process. Very lightweight. They're not even using Fuji RPC. They're using TT RPC. That's very low memory consumption to, to be babysitting your container. In Kubernetes, it has to be your pod with multiple containers. But that's the secret there. I have to understand that the shims will be bad, these, you know, babysitter there. And then if, you have, if the cluster has to be upgraded, anyone doing infra management on Kubernetes, <laughs> um, the, the Kubernetes, uh, the container D itself can be updated because the shims are not going to be, you know, removed. We can update container D and leave the containers running. That's why it's safe because the shim is completely independent there and taking care of your containers. And then um, once the container is created, the client just get the ID of this container. Remember when you docker run, you can see the big ID number there on the screen. Let's go back here. The big ID there after docker run. Okay, let's say that's ID of the, the container. And then it's just wait, the client just wait, the container's running, there's someone taking care, I don't have to do anything. When, uh, when the shim, you know, when the container pretty much um, finish, exit, they let the, the, the client know, and they have to do the cleanup. They have to delete, you know, the, the task. They have to delete the container metadata. They have to delete the root file system that was created for them. They have to do that. Container D is doing all that job for us. And on the Go library, someone's doing that on the, on, on the Kubernetes interface. Uh, or you can do that if you do your integration for your project or if you want to use Container D directly for some reason. There are people building serverless platforms using Container D. Even we did. We have a few that just use, you know, like Azure Container Instance is not Kubernetes. It's just like a container group that uses Container D. There's no Kubernetes there, there's no orchestrator. Azure Container is just, just Container D. And that's how it works, but let's go for Kubernetes now. <laughs> let's get it more exciting now. Kubernetes says on each uh, node of the cluster, Kubernetes install, not as a container, as a process, something called kubelet. And that kubelet that talks with, you know, um, we've talked with the node and pretty much talks with the uh, container D using that container runtime interface, Serai. And container D is going to create your containers, that will be your pods. If you go more details, let's break this down. Kubelet again on the left. Talk with this container runtime interface that's inside container D, okay? The middle gray box. 
and then they talk with the image service, runtime service, remember the other diagram? And they need to talk with other service like networking, node resource interface, um, and then there is like a kind of a function call that they talk with the shims, you know, the, the task service or the container D pretty much client talk with the container D shim, you can see on the right where your pods are running. And the way that Kubernetes keep your pod running is creating this called pause container. Then you get this pause container, then create what it, whatever you want. And that's how they manage the life cycle. Um, if one container dies, they can you know, restart the container A because there is a pause container there that let them manage the life cycle of your pod. It's a name is very confusing because when that was created, uh, you know, on container D was kind of uh, kind of a pod sandboxy, you know, for, for Kubernetes. But now pod sandboxy could be other means other things. <laughs> and you're going to see that when all these um, Hyper-V, these virtualization containers like Kata Container, Gvisor, they come in place now. We now have to manage not only the pod, but the virtual machine that's around your pod as well. <laughs> and keep in mind, that's running inside like a node of your cluster. Kubernetes control plane is going to decide which node they're going to deploy. They're going to say, okay, kubelet of node one, can you deploy my application? And you know, that's going to happen in one node. If we have multiple replicas, the same process will be happening multiple times in different nodes. Make sense? I'm trying to <laughs> do a language that Go as in a sequence, but that's getting more complicated now. I'm not going to details that. I'm, not, I'm just going to show that for you, okay? You can take a picture of yourself. You can get the slides from the previews, you know, the um, uh, keep going from the team explaining that. But I'm going to break this apart, okay? That's the whole thing. Client on the left, the main daemon, you know, API in core there, and all back backend, plugins, shims, they're all extensions. And I'm going to say client. That's the goal. That's the goal thing. The one nice thing on, on Container D is that they try to see, be that smart, smart client. If you are old enough, you're going to remember this <laughs> name called smart client. Smart client means you try to do everything on the client side as much as you can. And that's where they keep trying to do as much as can on the client side, on the Go library there, without talking to the container D, you know, process daemon. And the main, um, you know, let's say tools or CLI command lines that we have for container D are Docker that I just used there. Uh, CTR, when you install container D, come with the CTR command line. You can, you can run containers, but it's not very friendly like Docker. Okay, NetCTL is very, pretty much like Docker. And there's uh, CI, uh, CRI CTL that's for Kubernetes. Okay, then we pretty much talking to pods, not with containers, and, and those are the, the four ones. I remember that uh, I said that you could run that on Mac OS, and um, the Colima is the one that you can, you can run on Mac OS. Russia Desktop is another option that use container D, and, and if you look inside the client, you can see all the services. It's kind of microservice architecture there that you have the container, the tasks, you know, the, all, the, all the service for, for the snapshots. You want to talk with the snapshot that the, where the container image is stored. And, and from there, you have integration with you know, extensions, with plugins. But that's all we start from there, from this client library. Then I have that middle there, where I call daemon, that's API and core on the left are pretty much the core of the container D, let's say, because uh, you know, is where the API endpoints are and the microservices are on the daemon side. Um, and the backend plugins are everything loaded based on plugins that you are using, like depends on your settings when you install container D, or if you're using like Azure Kubernetes service, we setting that for you with you know the plugins that normally are using. 
um, depend of your like node pool, we're going to set those things for you. Um, a snapshot, remember the first slide I was talking about lace loading. Lace loading is one of those snapshotters. You're going to, you know, using those um, overlay um, uh, snapshotters as the default normally. And, and you have these runtimes when uh, we, can, we can run the containers. I'm not going in details here because um, I'm not one of the maintainers. I cannot say exactly what is on each one, but you probably can guess. Um, and become very complex to use the Go library, you know, sometimes because you have to understand this step by step what you have to create. You have to create a snapshot, you have to create the container, you have to create the task, and you have to delete all these things at the end. Go is very nice for that because, you know, you can just defer the delete, you, and they're going to delete when everything is gone. Um, but it is complex. Luckily, we have a team, you know, from many maintainers, even Docker, Microsoft, maintaining those uh, AWS, Head uh, Head, IBM, and um, and on those na snapshots, one that I know closer is that um, AKS artifact streaming, where um, we try to do lazy loading because most of like 80% of the time to run your pod, your container comes from the time to download the Docker image. And then we said, we have to kind of do a caching <laughs> or lace loading. And the way that we do it was creating this AKS artifact streaming. Um, AWS created another one as well. I think sources from AWS and Google created another one. They're all trying to solve the same problem that um, give more performance when you run your pod and you can take like five, 10 times faster than, than before using those snapshotters. Or you can use you know, the default community. One of the most popular now is Star GZ. Um, and I have these running on my machine to run WebAssembly, it's very nice. But um, there are like snapshotters for Windows, for Linux containers running on Windows, Elical, uh, and so on. Then, if you want to play, it's a nice thing to play because you can get performance that you never imagined that was possible. Imagine a, <laughs> your application now running like booting like five or ten times faster than before. <laughs> and it's very important if you build a serverless application, you know, you want to, the warm up, it cannot take like <laughs> five minutes or, you know, one minute, even 30 seconds is a lot. Um, and then come to the shims. The shims are these babysitters, <laughs> and a big thing on the new version, I'm, I think I have, I have a lot on the version, but we have three versions at the moment for ContainerD, 1.6, 1.7, and version two. Pretty much everyone's using 1.7, but we're supposed to be on version two already, but we're not. That means that we have version two release candidate five at the moment, and means that 1617 will be there for a little bit longer. 16 was the long term service, but because container is something that you know, has to be <laughs> maintained, upgraded all the time, I think 16 and 17 is go they both going parallel, and pretty much all the cloud providers using 17. And we're very soon to have to do this move to version 2, and you're going to understand why. As a a lot of changes and improvements. One of the improvements are this sandbox controller, where now we have to manage this hypervisor. And developing these, they find out that they need to improve the way that they get the Docker image, the image from the hash tree. Because now we're not just getting the image and putting inside, you know, the container store on the container D. They have to put inside the VM <laughs> that's running your virtualized, you know, environment. And then you have to give more control, and they also create, we're going to see here, one thing called transfer service. That would be more flexible the way that you manage transfer service. And, uh, but we're going to see those more up front there. But the, the common Linux uh, runtime is run C, pretty much. Um, and the external C is uh, like run WASI for WebAssembly, very popular. You can run that, like probably on Azure Kubernetes service, you can run that. I have this running on my laptop here. 
you can um, cut the containers. Cut the containers give you this extra isolation. Imagine if you want to do multi-tenant application on the same node of your cluster. And what most of people do, it, create another cluster because they don't want to annoy neighbor, they don't want security reasons. With those new you know, sandbox, you're probably going to be able to run multi-tenant on the same node of the same cluster because you'll be with Hyper-V isolation. We're pretty much running VMs <laughs> on a Hyper-V host <laughs> or any virtualization host that you have. Okay. Then container uh, version two come with these transfer servers that I talked about. Simplified, you know, I'm going to have another slide to show transfer servers. Uh, sandbox API, that pretty much that virtualization there. Uh, node resource interface, and um, that get you know the status of of your pods running on the node, and also can do small modification of your container. I know sounds scary but very you know, limited. Your runtime has to uh, enable that to allow this kind of node customization that change your pod specification a little bit for some reasons. And come soon, what they wanna work, they wanna simplify you know, that service and container service as well. Maybe you don't have to create the container, create the task, you can just do it in one go. <laughs> like we do on Docker, and uh, they're trying to simplify to be easier for the goal, you know, client. But they're going to do that without breaking anything else that's already, you know, created. That's very hard. Any developer here know that's very hard to do refactoring sometimes in a library that's used by everyone. And uh, the transfer service, they're going to be able to do this. They're going to be able, from the Go library, you know, get the container image from the hash tree to the image store on container D, from your image store to any registry, that's the push, pull and push, that's the common ones. But now you're going to have this import, export, um, you know, and, and, and so on. Even having, I think the last one, hash to hash tree, um, you know, get from this hash tree, move to another hash tree, and you're going to be able to do that from container D directly. And container D doesn't keep any credentials when you talk with the container hash tree. That's a good thing. That's it. No, don't worry about container D is not keeping your you know, credentials when you're using Kubernetes. Um, and that's, that's a nice thing. And that's how the transfer works. Maybe a little bit too small. Can you, can you, can you see that? Um, but the client talk with container D API. Um, you know, transfer from hash tree to the, to the local. And then the transfer service pretty much um, get the, the, resolve the image name, then there's all the authorization, get credentials, <laughs> go back to the client for the credentials, nothing's done on the, on the server container D side, credentials on the client side, then get the image digest, and then start all the, the get the manifest of the Docker image, and send that to the client, and then the transfer is to see but you can see that all the, the credentials are done on the client side. I think that's the most important of this diagram for you to understand the security of that. And let me try to show something burning. Before I go, you can, you can take a picture if you want from that one. That's the Slack channel and then uh, the container D repository that I'm going to show here. One, two. Any questions so far? Let me try to do something fun here. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to install Debian on my, on my machine. I have here Windows subsystem for Linux, and I can see I have Debian open, Debian. I also have Ubuntu. I have Kali Linux. I have a few distros here, but I'm going to use this one. And I also have Docker desktop. But this container here is running on my machine, on my Docker desktop installation. But they're not, it's not running here. This one is another one, different port number. Then I have two container D running in parallel. 
one on Ubuntu, another on Debian. I'm going to focus more on my Debian one. But just to show that when you run something here, port 8078, that's not running here on my Docker. Nothing under my sleeves, <laughs> okay? But that's running on my Windows subsystem for Linux. And here, and then the screenshot that I put on this slide, that's the Docker run that I just did here. And if you do a Docker inspect on that, that ID here, you don't have to type the whole thing. I just Docker inspect. You're going to see what we just discussed. Star GZ, that, that snapshot that was used, because that's the one that I set as default when I install container D to get the lazy loading. You can see the port number, the port binding was done, restart polis. Uh, I'm gonna scroll down for the networking side. Um, star GZ, yep. Let me get the host here. Then I have the bridge network. Where's my bridge network? There you go. I have my IP number. I can access from this IP number. If I got this IP number here, WSL is giving you know, a bridge network with my Windows, and I am get this IP number. And you're going to also see that run C is the runtime that run that. Um, where is run C? Uh, maybe it's not showing here on that. Anyway, that's the docker inspect thing that's running like container D locally. And another thing is, if we, the size is okay, is the CTR command line. If you go CTR, you now have another command line that's called, you know, container cell line. That's the version that I'm using. And you have the same. Remember the, the service that you saw on the slides? All the image containers, snapshotters, uh, sandbox—they all here. You can you can talk with you know container D with CTR, um, and it can also run a container. Let's say you can get my. Um, I think it can run like, like Red's cache here. Let's say. There you go. I have the. The, the Docker image already cached, otherwise we'll be downloading the Docker image. But I just run running container D. If I go on my Docker desktop, it's not there because it's not running on my machine, it's running on inside that Linux distribution here. So if I, if I do the same sudo like CTR uh, image list, Um, you have the image, and you can also um, have container, and also container list, uh, list. Command line is netctl. Netctl, you pretty much can run everything that um, runs on Docker. You can run here. Then if I take this out a little bit, um, um, you, you have pretty much a Docker like CLI. That's not CTL. Docker run, everything else you can have here. I can give you a command. If you run this full, you know, Docker uh, net CTL run like I, like I did with Docker. And funny thing is, um, namespace is a thing on container D. Means that when you run a container, you, have, you can have multiple namespace. Because I install container D here using Mobi, like Docker engine that come with container D. Um, I haven't used Docker desktop to install here, just like Mobi that come with container D. And when I run here, I didn't set the namespace. What I did? Name, just name. There's no namespace there. Then that thing is running on um, the namespace. If I say image or uh, PS, like Docker PS, there's nothing there. Then I have to say namespace, let's say default. 
Um, just name space. And space. Oh, let's say dash A. Yeah, dash A. I get, I think, let me get here. Yeah, and get all the containers. But it's pretty much by namespace. If you look container D, even CTR, if I go CTR, there's one thing here called um, namespace. See that? The default is default one. But if you want to see the, <laughs> because I still have Docker here. Look, that's not my Docker desktop. That's Docker that I install here. If I do Docker PS, they're using the Docker namespace. Docker creates a namespace from container D just for them. Then I send, then now you are isolating your containers by namespace as well on your single node. When you run these on, on Kubernetes, Kubernetes create a namespace on container D, k8s.io, that's the namespace they create normally, and that you run there. But if you're building something and you want to isolate your inside the same container D, you just create completely uh, namespace isolation, and then you can use these on the common line. I, I never published those instructions here, but maybe I, I need to publish. But I recommend you, to be honest, to use container, you know, Docker desktop. Uh, if you want to play with that, <laughs> that's the way I did it. Just create a WSL installation, Debian, and went for the documentation. If you go on the, the install Mobi, that's the Mobi slash Mobi on GitHub. You can get the you know, the latest fashion, you can go on container D, you can go see all the projects of container D, including the get started, that explain how to install container D locally on your machine. You can download the latest fashion if you wanna play with the version two, or you can get, you know, the version that I just installed, 1722. And then, Another thing that I use was Mobi, that released here Mobi. I did install container D using, what's the version, let me show here. Was that version here, 23.1? 23, I think, 23.1, or 27.3.1. And uh, on the release notes, you can see which container D version they're using, 1.7.22. That's the container D that comes with Mobi, that's Pimash. If you install that, it comes with Docker CLI, Docker Compose, Container D, and you can do exactly what I did here. That's the, the Mobi project that you can play. And that's what Docker uses on Docker Desktop. That's exactly Mobi. What we call Docker Engine. Engine now is a package, but Docker is doing a lot of other configuration like credential store. Then if you try to do it yourself, you're going to get on those pain points. It's all fixed, you know, done by, by Docker Desktop, by Russia Desktop, any other platform that's using ContainerD. Or you can boot, build the next one. I always try to make someone to build something new and bring on the next conference. <laughs> Why you cannot build the next version of that? Because there is open source, all the code is there, it's Go library, go ahead. Any questions? Uh, I think that's what I have for today. Thank you so much.